All right, so um, we were in the middle of talking about uh, dealing with changing data. And in particular, we were uh, talking about the different types of uh, correctness guarantees that we wanted to enforce um, in the presence of uh, changing data. One of, the big, uh, one of the big things that we were trying to enforce uh, was uh, how do you safely allow multiple transactions uh, to, to work uh, together. And in particular, we were, we were looking at two of the two specific properties uh, that databases try and enforce, atomicity and isolation. Um, the idea that a transaction can, uh, should I execute in its own little world, in other words, isolation, uh, and the idea that a transaction should either execute successfully or not execute at all, or at least have no visible effects, in other words, atomicity. Um, today we're going to uh, continue looking at atomicity but look at uh, a set of solutions uh, that deal not just with, with atomicity, but now durability. Uh, so specifically, we're going to be looking at ways to ensure both atomicity and durability, um, in other words, logging. So before I get into the nitty gritty details, uh, conceptually, what does it mean uh, when the database responds to a commit message saying, uh, your transaction is committed. What should that mean? Yeah. The changes that were laid out during the transaction were applied to error. OK. So there, uh, let's unpack that statement. The, the changes that were made uh, during the transaction were applied without error. So there's a couple of different uh, words you use there uh, that I'm going to pick apart. So apply. What do you mean by apply? Well, in a transaction, if something were to go wrong because it's all packed together in a single transaction, you can roll back and effectively undo or um, not apply what that is. OK, so that, that covers actually my next question, which is uh, without error. So there. No, if there is any errors occurred, you don't want any any visibility of, of the transaction. So there's there's atomicity right there. Um, but what do you mean by apply? Like, sure, I, I I want the changes to be visible somehow. But what do I? What does that mean? The data is actually. Hmm? The data is actually. Uh, the data is actually moved uh, from where to where. Or to where? Give someone else a chance to talk. Uh, anyone? Is it, what does applied mean in this context? Yeah. The transaction changed uh, the like state. Trans what state? Like the transaction was you have transaction go on like A gives some. Okay, so we changed the state of the world. That's a pretty, uh, that's a pretty heavy, uh, heavy idea there. That you, uh, there, there's just some point, and that point you kind of transition from uh, nothing having happened to everything having happened. So, okay, we're we're dealing with abstracts here, which is good. I, uh, I did say we were going to start with abstracts. Let's dig in a little deeper here. It's changed the state of the world. It's applied something. These are all kind of getting at the same basic idea. What is the state of the world? What is getting applied? Or what is getting, what is being applied? Uh, applied as a subject, right? What is, uh, what is the application being applied to? Or alternatively, what is the state of the data, uh, the, the world, as, as far as the database is concerned? The current set of tuples. The current set of tuples. Okay, so there's some state in the world. The the, the database's current data, the, the set of tuples that that are, are in the database. Where do those live? In the relation. In the relation. Okay. Be more specific. Uh, 
Where is the relation with? Hmm? On disk? Okay, that's uh, so for some databases it lives on disk. Somewhere in memory, that's uh, for some databases it lives in memory. So what I'm getting at here is that there's, there's this relation object that we're, we're modifying, and we want to make sure that, that uh, when that change happens, we have some guarantee that we're actually in this new world, that, that when this database comes back to us um, and says, yes, uh, A has transferred money to B, um, that implies something in the outside world. Maybe uh, B, is, uh, B is selling something to A. So if, uh, if A transfers $100 to B, and then B gives them, uh, I don't know, uh, a valuable baseball card or something, then you want to make sure, B wants to be really, really sure that when, uh, when uh, so Alice buys a baseball card from, from Bob, um, Bob wakes up the next morning, he wants to be absolutely certain that his bank account has the hundred dollars from Alice. So there's uh, quite a few things that could potentially uh, go wrong during this process. Um, so a little bit of an example here that uh, will hopefully motivate the, um, the, the rest of this class. Um, let's say I have five transactions um, in the system. Five transactions have been started. And uh, from the very start, uh, transact or five transactions will be uh, registered in the system. Excuse me. So transaction one and transaction four uh, start initially. Uh, transaction two eventually uh, gets going. Um, time keeps moving on. Uh, transaction one eventually commits. Uh, transaction three then starts up as well. Transaction five starts up. Um, Transaction two commits, transaction three commits, uh, transaction four keeps uh, going on, transaction five keeps going on, and then boom! System, system crashes. So in this state, what guarantees do we want to preserve? Uh, T, uh, one, uh, T3 like, could... Like, let's say, so you have, like, three or something. Okay. T1 will come T4. And it keeps going. What do you mean three of something? And then T2 pulls from the 12. And then once T1 and T2 finish, it will, like... Uh, like, like so let, let's say there's a, so you're, you're saying what if there's a, a conflict uh, between them? What if they broke isolation and as a consequence can't commit? Uh, okay, perfectly valid concern. Let's say that uh, hasn't happened. Let's say the system in this case looked at the state of the world, looked at T1 and said, yep, T1 is safe, I'm, I'm happy. Uh, there's no chance that uh, T1 violated isolation, violated uh, atom, or atomicity. Um, T1 is safe to commit, T2 is safe to commit, T3 is safe to commit. Uh, meanwhile, at the time of the crash, T4 and T5 are still in run. So perfectly valid concern, but uh, just as a matter of simplification, let's say that's not a concern here. Or let's say that the system has determined that it, at least in the case of T1, T2, and T3, it's not a concern. So what guarantees in that, yeah. want to make sure that the modifications for T4 and T5 are in the same state that they were at the time of the crash. The relations. The, uh, the relations. Um, 
Um, so you're assuming that transaction four and transaction five can resume from where they left off? No. No. Ah, okay. So you're saying that transaction four and transaction five should be wiped out uh, entirely. You want to hide them. Okay, so challenge one. We want to make sure that transaction four and transaction five, uh, we want to wipe them out of existence as if they never existed in the first place. Okay, guarantee number one. Anything that was running at the time of the transaction should go away. What else? Yeah. Okay. So if the system said that the uh, if if the system said that transaction one is committed, we better make damn sure that that uh, transaction uh, is back is, is successfully committed when the system comes back up. So uh, to recap. Committed transactions should still be in the database when it comes back up, and uncommitted transactions shouldn't leave any trace uh, after the fact. Okay, so what we're going to look at today is uh, techniques for ensuring that um, A, uh, any uh, transactions that were safely on disk, uh, sorry, that were uh, indicated to be committed, are actually going to be safe on disk. And this turns out to be a much more difficult uh, problem due to some somewhat subtle factors. Um, we want to also look at ways to make sure that uh, transactions that were aborted get safely rolled back, and as a generalization of that, that we can effectively abort transactions uh, that, uh, that were uh, running in the system at the time of a crash. So let's take a look at these problems one at a time. Um, the first we want to make sure that the, the transactions, uh, that once we say that a transaction is committed, that it is, in fact, going to be safely uh, committed to disk. So we're going to take um, a slightly simplified model here. Um, and I'm going to emphasize one point. This is not as much of an issue for in-memory databases, but uh, for distributed databases and on-disk databases. Um, we're going to uh, create a kind of model of the disk or of, of distributed systems where um, writes are atomic. We have this, this basic guarantee that if, the, um, if we tell the disk to perform a write and the disk come, comes back and says the write is performed, then we can be reasonably safe uh, in, in assuming that the data is, is safely on disk or safely on the other machine or safely somewhere. Um, this is not always a perfectly safe model to work with. Um, there are uh, increasingly, uh, an increasing number of disks that don't actually provide this guarantee. They'll, they'll tell you that something is safely written, but if there's a power failure, poof. Um, or there could just be corruption on the disk, which again, <laughs> violates this assumption. But we're gonna assume, uh, just for simplicity at this point, that if the disk tells me that something, that a, a, a atomic write uh, has succeeded, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust it and assume that it's okay. Question so far? All right. So there are, uh, with that simplified model, there are basically two types of problems that could potentially occur. So first off, the crash could occur partway through a write. I start a write, uh, but it never actually finishes. The other possibility is that a crash could occur even before I request a write. Now, if the crash occurs before I request a write, that might not necessarily seem like it could cause problems. Um, but what happens if you need to perform two separate writes to complete uh, a task? So I can guarantee that one write is atomic, but I can't necessarily guarantee that two separate writes will be atomic. So what I'd like to do is come up with some way that I can guarantee to myself that I'm going 
no matter what happens, no matter when in the process a crash occurs, that I can guarantee to myself that everything that I want to do safely is, uh, and, and atomically, actually occurs atomically, even without the, the guarantee of, of being able to perform multiple writes uh, atomically on the, uh, on the database. So the trick we're going to use, uh, quite simply, is, is something called write-ahead logging. Um, and the idea is that anytime you're going to do something on disk, you do it twice. Uh, you first write a record of what you are about to do, and then you actually do it. And this record serves as a kind of uh, a set of notes that you can uh, cheat off of if a crash occurs during the process. So let's uh, take a really uh, quick look at this. Um, I've got my database over there, and I've got my log over there. Um, if I want to perform a write, uh, let's say I want to overwrite uh, A with 10, the first thing I'm gonna, going to do is I'm going to record in my log that I'm about to write uh, a value of 10 into A. Then I actually update A. And I don't actually do that uh, update until, uh, uh, until the log is, is safely on disk. Questions so far? Yeah. That's a great question. So, how does um, how do I uh, how do I use this to make sure that um, I'm actually doing things atomically? Uh, was that your question as well? Uh, I was just going to ask if it's like the same thing as in terms of journaling and operating system. Exactly. Um, we're going to take it one step past journaling, uh, but this at the right ahead logging and journaling are uh, cases where databases and operating systems basically came to the same conclusion, that this is a good idea. Um, so, how do, you take, uh, how do you actually use this to protect multiple rights? Well, okay, this, this doesn't necessarily help me all that much, uh, but what if I now, let's say, want to simultaneously modify C and E in one operation? What I'm going to do is uh, perform multiple rights on the log, in one operation, and make sure that those that all of the uh, that all of the the writes that I want to perform atomically are safely on disk. Now, once I've already appended uh, two, these two operations to, to the disk, then I can safely start modifying the database. So, uh, if I want to overwrite C with eight and E with nine, first I write everything to the log make sure that that's safely on disk, and then I can safely start modifying the uh, database itself. Does that answer your question? So let's actually, uh, you know, don't take my word for it. Why is this safe? So there are two operations here. Sorry, there are three conceptual operations here. We've got the one or more writes to the log, and we've got one or more writes to the database. Now, one thing I'm kind of excluding from here from simplicity is that I, that I can also put uh, markers into the log that say when it's when I've finished doing a task. So conceptually, you could say uh, do a write to A, checkpoint. Write to C, write to E, checkpoint. <coughs> Actually, I shouldn't use the word checkpoint, but Safe, finished. So, write C, E, safe. In general, this is going to be one append, one write operation. Uh, the log is append only. I'm only going to be tacking things onto the end of it. Probably fit that into one operation. But even if I can't, um, the database hasn't actually been changed. At this point, the uh, the state of the database is perfectly, perfectly safe. The state of the log might be a little weird, but the state of the database is, is safe. Now, once I write, and make sh uh, write that finished message and make sure to myself, uh, assure myself that that finished me message is safely on disk, which I can do because I'm assuming that when the date, uh, disk tells me that something's written, it's written. 
So now, it's, now that finished message is safely on disk. Then I can start messing with the database. So what happens if a failure occurs at any of these, these points? So a failure could occur before I've, uh, before I've written that finished message to disk. What do I do at that point? Do I need to do anything? Well, if I don't have the, the finished message, so uh, let's expand on this. So I've got my database, uh, which is um, which is at ten. Uh, 12, 5, 18, 16. And then my log looks like um, write A, 10, finished, write C, 8, write E, 9. All right, so what happens if the crash occurs even before I do any of this? comes back, it's as if nothing has happened. It's as if the second transaction hasn't done a single thing. What happens if I crash at this point? Hmm? Right, so I'm, I'm missing this operation, but I don't have a commit. So again, from the perspective of the database, I haven't actually uh, I haven't actually changed the database. So from the perspective of what's going on here, again, nothing has happened. Same thing if I crash after writing uh, WE, but before writing a finish message. Yeah. I can write a finish, I can append a finished message to my log, and at that point, I can be absolute, uh, I, can, uh, I can do this in one operation. This is constant size message, no matter what kind of disk I'm using. I can be guaranteed that once this is on disk, I'm safe. And once that happens, I can go back to the user and say, OK, this whole atomic se sequence of operations, safe on disk at that point. So what happens if a crash occurs after this? Well, I know exactly what writes I was going to perform. So when the database comes back up, it can, say, it can look at the log and say, oh, hey, you were going to write an 8. You were going to write a 9. And I see that you finished that transaction. So I'm, I can just redo those operations, apply them directly to the database, and get to a consistent state. What happens if I crash, let's say, after I've uh, updated C, but before I've updated E? Same exact thing. Apply this, right, sir? Nicely idempotent. I can write 8 to C as many times as I like, and still going to be 8. If I write an 8 here, still 8. Uh, so I can replay the entire transaction, updating everything uh, according to what I, I reminded myself to, what, what I uh, uh, put down in my log, and be guaranteed that I'm going to reach uh, the state at, the, uh, at that point. Yeah. So you're creating, you, you maintain, the idea of a write-ahead log is that you keep two copies of the data. You keep one copy in the log, and then you keep one copy in uh, the database itself. There's ways of kind of combining these two a little bit, and uh, we can get into those later in the term if people are interested. But uh, from the perspective of uh, just generic write-ahead logging, Keep two copies. Uh, two copies of the database, so like, yeah. not just like the general information, but also the, the message. 
So uh, uh, let me. So you, you write this to the log, but you then crash. At which point? Uh, so you actually write this to the database, but you've not yet returned that you have. Okay. Some. So uh, your uh, so the the potential inconsistency insist, inconsistency would occur if you uh, applied this change to the database before you got to the finish message. I agree completely, and um, that's why what we want to, uh, that's why the ordering of these operations is extremely important. You can't start modifying the database until you've recorded this finished message in the log. Although, we will uh, look at, way, uh, later on uh, today, we'll look at some ways that you can actually get around that. But yeah, good observation. Any other questions on right head logging? Have I convinced you that uh, that this is safe? Okay. All right. So um, this is good. You know, this this is a way to ensure that we can perform uh, arbitrarily large atomic writes to the disk, assuming that the disk gives us the ability to perform even small atomic writes. Uh, but that's not the only thing that we want uh, to be able to do. Uh, one of the uh, other important things that we want to be able to do is uh, make these updates efficiently. And uh, well, uh, you kind of waiting until you finish writing everything to the log and only then updating the database uh, ends up being kind of slow. Um, because you have to make sure that everything is written to disk, then you have to flush everything to disk, and that is an uh, writes to disk are slow, but flushes, where you ma actually make sure that the uh, data gets forced onto the, the disk, basically disables any benefits that you get from, from buffering, uh, from uh, like operating system level uh, optimizations. This is basically saying, I, I don't, don't try and optimize this, get it to disk, uh, and uh, yeah. And waiting for that to happen before even before you start modifying the database itself, is uh, potentially going to be very, very slow. So in order to make that a little bit faster, what we can do is kind of optimistically start modifying the database, allow ourselves a little bit of leeway in terms of, of uh, what goes into the actual database on disk, but at the same time, start recording enough information in the log that we can undo anything that uh, that <clears throat> we may have accidentally uh, put into the database. And as a side effect, this also gives us the ability to uh, abort transactions uh, during the process. So as a simplification, um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to look at this, uh, I'm going to uh, present a simplified version uh, of, of this where we're basically going to write everything to, uh, write everything out to disk immediately uh, and we're going to try and perform uh, rollback with multiple transactions. So here, everything is getting flushed, uh, again, just to, to recap, the, everything is getting written out to the database uh, immediately. And what we're going to try and do is make sure that we're recording enough information in the log that we can do that safely. So transaction one has uh, an operation here, uh, A equals uh, 20. Uh, we're going to update A, uh, then we're going to perform an operation by transaction 2 to update, uh, to update E, then we're going to perform uh, an update from, uh, to B from transaction 1, transaction uh, 2 is going to perform its right, transaction 1 is going to commit, and then transaction uh, 2 is going to abort. And that's a little bit of a problem because now the database if I've been logging all of these, even if I've been logging all of these operations, I still have this weird inconsistent state on B. Uh, note that this also applies to, to memory, uh, uh, to data in memory. Uh, because well, I usually only want to keep one copy of, of data in, in memory for, for a database. Uh, 
uh, unless I'm using uh, uh, versioning or uh, kind of the staged model we talked about during optimistic concurrency control. <laughs> so basically I want to have, uh, I want to know what kind of information I can use to um, undo that operation to B. Now, one way to get around this would be to one way to get around this would to be uh, would be to keep multiple copies of the database in memory. Um, so we talked about this idea during optimistic concurrency control, and uh, in that case, well, it simplifies things. Each database uh, has its own version of the database to to work with, its own set of of operations that it wants to apply, and uh, it's not, uh, there's no chance that uh, some accidental operation of, of a transaction that's aborted uh, is going to affect the, uh, the, the database. But unfortunately, this, uh, this approach to staging isn't necessarily always going to be possible. Um, staging can take up uh, a lot more memory. Uh, merging these operations after the fact uh, can be uh, harder. And just merging databases after the fact um, is going to be a higher latency process because uh, databases can be very large. So um, let me rephrase uh, the, the, the goal that we're trying to accomplish here. Um, what we'd like to do is be able to provide uh, some sort of rollback functionality uh, for the case where we only have one database uh, to work with, where we're, uh, we have one canonical copy of the database that all of the transactions are modifying simultaneously. So, in this context, what we can do, uh, in addition to logging what we're about to write, we can also log what the original value uh, that should be uh, in the record was before we performed the write. Uh, so, for example, uh, transaction A wants to update, uh, wants to write uh, 10, or the first transaction wants to write 10 to A, it's also going to say that the original value uh, was 8. Transaction C wants to overwrite, uh, sorry, transaction 2 wants to overwrite C with 8, uh, it's also going to point out that the original value was 5. And same thing for uh, transaction 2 updating E with 9, it's going to say that the original value was 16. Now, the way that this helps us is that we can now go backwards through the log as well as forwards. Uh, we're going to need to keep one additional uh, piece of, of information around in order to uh, accomplish this, uh, namely a list of active transactions. And what this allows us to do is to identify and associate individual operations in the log with specific transactions. So now if transaction one uh, here, um, oh, and excuse me, one other thing that we need to keep around is some sort of way of referring to specific log messages. Uh, so usually what you'll do is keep around a counter. Uh, every time you log a new message, you increment the counter, and keep track of um, what uh, every log message is identified by this, the value of the counter uh, when it was logged. So transaction one here um, was uh, participating in a couple of operations here, but most recently uh, we're going to keep track of the, the most recent log entry that it, uh, that it modified. And in this case, that's going to be the right to eat. So if transaction one turns out to abort, or if for whatever reason we need to undo uh, the effects of transaction one, we can go to that <coughs> last log entry and see, oh, E was uh, going to replace 16 with 9. Well, the value is 9. We're going to undo that. And we know exactly how to undo it because we have the original value uh, of the operation. 
Now, we also need to keep track of the remaining uh, log entries that are associated with A. So we're going to basically keep these in a linked list. I'll get into a little more on that later. But here, let's assume that uh, just these, these three operations uh, are the entirety of transaction one. So uh, we've undone uh, the right to E. We can also undo uh, the right to C. And we can undo the right to, um, the right to A. Questions so far? All right. Um, so we need to keep uh, keep track of a couple of of uh, additional things. As I said, uh, let's get into a little more detail on those. So we need to keep track. Uh, we need to keep. Um, let's go into this process in a little more detail. So uh, we have this transaction table that tells us which transactions are active, as well as the last. Uh, log entry to uh, be applied to that uh, transaction, or to participate in that transaction, trigger, triggered by that transaction. So if we want to abort uh, one uh, particular transaction, uh, we're first going to actually record what we're about to do. So anytime we do anything, uh, we're going to uh, write down what we're about to do. So we're going to write down a, a message saying that we're about to uh, abort this transaction. Uh, and in the transaction table, we have this record of the transaction and the last log entry, or the last uh, what are called sequence number, uh, that the transaction uh, performed. This uh, sequence number is basically a pointer into the log that says, uh, OK, the last log entry performed by this transaction was that one. Uh, the log entry is going to have a bunch of information about what uh, operation uh, was getting recorded in the log. <laughs> and it's also going to contain a pointer to the last log entry that, was, uh, that participated in the same transaction. Um, that log entry is also going to have a pointer to the previous log entry, and so forth all the way back through the log. So in effect, uh, for every transaction, we can create a sequence of, uh, of log entries participating in that transaction, basically as a linked list. Questions so far? Now it turns out a linked list is actually quite uh, an appropriate data structure here, mainly because uh, transactions get uh, aborted in isolation. Uh, if you want to abort one transaction, you need to be able to page through the log to find uh, the log entries for that particular transaction. Um, you're only ever accessing uh, the, the set of, of, uh, of the set of log entries participating in a given transaction uh, sequentially, so uh, linked list actually works out quite well. Okay, questions so far? All right. Um, I think this might actually be a good place to uh, pause really quickly. Uh, so before we get into atomicity, uh, let's take a quick break and be back. 115-ish. Server crash. There's no nothing to abort. Everything was committed. Whatever. When it recovers, does it still look at the log and like write over yeah. all the so, other stuff? So how many logs does it know? To how many? Like how many 
transaction was a note to go back. Great right question, and uh, something we'll get into in the second half of it. So there's, uh, the short of it is that there is a big and messy uh, process called ARIES that has been exhaustively proven uh, to be uh, safe. Basically, if you, uh, there, there is a sequence of steps that uh, combines undo logging and redo logging uh, in such a way that it because uh, so if you have both uh, redo logging the first thing we discussed and undo logging the going backwards then uh, transactions that are sitting at the end of the, the process are uh, need to be aborted which means there's some set of, of uh, things that you log that you don't want to make that um, so uh, it's a very good question to uh, what which log entries do we need to replay, which entries do we not need to replay. Um, and the short one minute version is, uh, essentially what we're gonna do is start by reconstruct, using the log to reconstruct the state of the database at the time of the crash, and then recognizing that there is a set of transactions that are still open at that time, aborting those transactions, uh, basically, just going back through the process of and, and uh, those, those transactions. Um, and I'm missing a thing. Oh, uh, sorry. So, uh, reconstruct the state of the, the database in memory, uh, reconstate, uh, reconstruct the state of the database on disk, and then revert the state of the database based on uh, uh, by reverting transactions that. Uh, that you should never have been committed in the first place. Messy, but it works. Uh, and we'll hopefully get to it. get back into it. Are there any other questions? All right. So we've talked about undo and redo logging and noted that they're useful both for aborting transactions as well as recovering from crashes. But the other part of recovering from crashes is that we want to make sure that the uh, transactions that uh, kind of partly executed have no impact on the final state of the database. So um, basically we want to be able to uh, not just, uh, we want to essentially return the database to its uh, correct state <laughs> after the crash. And we're going to break that down into two steps. Uh, first we're going to look at uh, we're going to look at recovering the, the uh, state of the database uh, as it was at the time of the crash, and then we're going to use undo logging to recover it. 
Now, in order to do that, we need to keep track of a few pieces of information. So as I've already mentioned, uh, we've been talking about, uh, as I've already mentioned, uh, for undo logging, uh, we actually already need uh, a couple of pieces. So we need to have the log, we need to have the actual database uh, on disk, and we need to have this table of active transactions in memory. Uh, so where do each of these live? Um, the database obviously already lives on disk. The log already lives on disk. Uh, interesting thing about uh, the uh, table of active transactions is that we actually don't need to save it to disk, which turns out to be fairly useful. It turns out we can actually reconstruct uh, the table of uh, active transactions if we're careful about what we log, we can actually reconstruct the table of active transactions by just looking at uh, the log itself. In order to do that, we need to keep track of a couple of different things. So we need to keep track of uh, which transactions have committed and which transactions have aborted. Um, so anytime a transaction either commits uh, or aborts, we're going to record it in the log. This is basically the, the finish message uh, that um, we talked about earlier. Um, the other thing that uh, we'd also like to log is that uh, committing and aborting um, are potentially lengthy processes. So commit or abort is basically the, um, the, the process of deciding whether you can commit, uh, as we talked about during optimistic concurrency control, can be quite expensive. Uh, the process of forcing everything to disk can be quite expensive. So what we're going to do is also record a, a new message that we're going to call end uh, that gets uh, triggered as soon as the transaction uh, informs us that it's okay uh, to start the commit process. So in other words, an abort can happen anywhere, uh, but then a transaction at some point is going to say, okay, I'm done with, that, with, with what I need to do. You can start the commit process. We'll log end. And at some later point, the database is going to decide that the uh, transaction can successfully commit and it's going to allow it to commit, and at that point, it's actually going to log a second message, uh, commit. So end is when the application or the transaction says it's done. Commit is when the database agrees that it's done. Questions so far? Anyone see something potentially missing from here? Yeah? Begin. Great point. When, I mean, when, uh, when do we actually, uh, so we're going to add new transactions. Why do we actually need them? Or sorry, losing track of uh, what I'm saying. Uh, why do we actually need a begin message? Yeah. To know how far back to roll back and abort. Uh, to know how far back to roll back. What do you mean by that? How far backwards you need to go to undo changes that were aborted. Okay. To know how. Uh, to know. Uh, so let me twist that around a little. Uh, to know when uh, the linked list ends. All right. Well, why not just have a null pointer? Okay. So. At least it, from the perspective of uh, going backwards, you can get away without, uh, without having uh, explicit uh, begin statement. Um, now we have this transaction table that we need to reconstruct. So there's one additional possible use for a begin statement in that uh, we'd like to, if a transaction uh, hasn't actually written anything or, or performed any actions, back up, uh, we could potentially want to use a, a begin statement to decide what to put into the transaction table. So remember, we're going to try and reconstruct the entire state of the database uh, at the time of the crash. Uh, 
And in order to do that, we need the uh, we need to know what transactions were running at the, the time that the crash occurred. Now, one way to uh, one way to simplify that is to just look at what transactions uh, what to go through the log entries and just with every log entry record the transaction uh, that caused it. So we can kind of go through the log and in the log see transactions one, five, seven, and nine have uh, have started. Back up a little. If we record with every log message the transaction that caused it, we can go through the log and figure out which transactions have actually tried to write something or do something to the database. So, at least from the perspective of, uh, of um, trying to recreate the transaction table, as long as a transaction actually writes something to the log, uh, we don't actually need an explicit message saying that the transaction has started because we can always reconstruct the transaction table by uh, going through the log and, and seeing all of the, the transactions that, uh, that wrote something. There's always the possibility that a transaction didn't write anything. But if the transaction never actually wrote anything, then what does it, its commit look like? I've lost everyone. Um, okay, so <coughs> let's have a quick. All right, we'll come back to the the question of begin, but uh, for now, take my word for it that you don't actually need uh, a begin, and we'll we'll see uh, how. Even in the absence of a begin operation, uh, you don't actually need to uh, to do any. Uh, you don't actually need a begin operation. Um, okay, so let's look at the process of actually doing a uh, a transaction commit. Oh, uh, excuse me. I actually got the got commit and end backwards. Um, commit is. Uh, commit is issued by the transaction or the application. End is issued by the uh, by the database, saying the commit is done. So, uh, in, when a transaction commits, the very first thing it will do, uh, and again, uh, correcting what I said earlier, got those flipped. Uh, commit. It's first going to write a commit message to the log, or commit record to the log, saying that. From the transactions perspective, everything is safe. Everything is okay. Everything is ready to go. Then um, it's going to make sure that all of the log records, up to and including the commit message, are safely on disk. This means flushing the entire log to disk if necessary, but if <laughs> It won't proceed past this point until that commit message is safely in the log. At that point, we can safely acknowledge to the user that the commit has succeeded, assuming that uh, isolation is uh, validated as well. But at this point, we can safely assume that the data is going to be durable, it's going to be persisted, and it's going to uh, survive uh, anything except for maybe a dinosaur attack. Um, so at that point, we can tell the user, we're good. Then we're also going to uh, write an end message to the log. And this is the database way, the database's way of saying, this is safely on disk, do this, maybe. <coughs> And it's going to start flushing the actual database out to disk as well. OK, so this is how the transaction uh, commits safely. What happens if the transaction aborts during this process? 
or Bert's earlier in the process. So, recall that the, the process we're doing in the work here is going to be to go through the log, visit every single uh, write that the transaction has performed, and we're going to undo that write. Whether the write happened in memory or on disk uh, doesn't really matter at this point, uh, but we're going to go through the log and replace everything with uh, its original value. Now, uh, for uh, reasons that will become clear in just a moment, the uh, database is actually going to uh, record not just, uh, not just the writes, it's also going to record the undos. So in this case, if transaction one does an abort, it's also going to record each operation that it undoes. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the log and say uh, that uh, we replace 16 with 9. Well, we're going to uh, abort uh, that particular right. We're going to undo that, excuse me, that right. And we're going to put down uh, what's known as a compensation log record, CLR, that uh, basically says, uh, that basically says, uh, or that points to the next thing to undo, as well as uh, the write that was performed. So that's, uh, in this case, we're writing a 16. Then it's actually going to modify the database and, and undo that write. That write. Okay, so, um, so this is what we've been doing in order to, uh, this is what we've been doing to create a log. Now, how do we actually use the, uh, use this log to recover from uh, a crash? So we basically want to make sure that at any point in either uh, the commit process or the undo process, we can recover uh, the entire state of the database at the time of the crash, uh, and then still be able to undo anything uh, that was um, still pending when the crash happened. We do this. All right. So we have our log, which basically has all of the, the writes that have ever been written. And what we're trying to do is reconstruct the state of the database. And recall, that means basically three things. That means the transaction table. That means the uh, excuse me, the, the transaction table and the database. The log uh, we're always going to assume is uh, is safe, at least up to the point that we care about. So let's look at these uh, the two things we need to reconstruct and uh, go through them one by one. So. We need to first reconstruct the active, uh, the active set of transactions. We're going to, in order to do that, we're going to go through this list of log entries and, 
going to go through this list of log entries and try and recover enough information in order to be able to reconstruct, uh, reconstruct the transaction table. So each of these in turn uh, writes, commits, and aborts. These are all operations that the transaction performs. So we're going to make sure that in our log entries we have uh, a transaction Uh, an ID for the transaction performing the operation, uh, sometimes you use XID uh, for short. Uh, the operation, the log sequence number, uh, as well as the last uh, log sequence number uh, of, the last log sequence number of uh, a transaction uh, last log sequence number uh, for that given transaction. Here's a quick example. Uh, so T1 is here. Create a simple schedule here. Okay, um, so this commit message is going to include the last uh, the, um, transaction two. Um, all these are going to be tagged with transaction two. Um, the commit message is also going to include the last log sequence number, uh, which was for this transaction three. And uh, we're also going to have a transaction. <coughs> now we've placed these. So this is eight. Uh, here we've got five, uh, eight, uh, no, ten. And here we've got nine. We've got a transaction table. For transaction one, for transaction two, uh, the last operation here was four. The last operation here, uh, well, let's pull out an operation five for the moment and say the last operation here was three. So this is basically pointing at that, and this is pointing at that. So you can think of these as kind of the, um, the start of the linked list. Okay, so recovery. Um, we're going to, the very first thing that happens during uh, the, the recovery process is we basically lost the transaction table. This is gone now. So when the database comes back up, we want to be able to reconstruct uh, the transaction from the state of 
uh, from the state of of the log. So we're going to go through the log entries one by one and use the information in the log entries to rebuild the transaction table. So we're going to the first thing we see is a log entry for a write for transaction one, and this turns out well obviously it's the the very first log entry. So uh, we're going to learn two things from this log entry. So the first thing we're going to learn is that there exists a transaction one. We had no record of that beforehand. So there exists a, a transaction, transaction one. Um, perform this operation. We're going to hold off on that for the moment. But we're going to learn that there's a transaction one and that its last operation was uh, log entry number one. Moving on, we're going to see that there now exists a transaction, transaction two, uh, and its last log entry was log entry two. <coughs> Moving on to three, well, we already know that transaction two exists, but now we've learned that it has performed another operation. So we're going to update the transaction table uh, to include that new last entry. And then we're going to learn that transaction one uh, committed at the very end. Meanwhile, transaction two is still running. So we've learned from this log that there exists a transaction one, that there exists a transaction two, that transaction one's last log entry was number four, that transaction two's last log entry was number three, uh, and that transaction one uh, acknowledged that it was ready to commit. Questions so far? Okay, so we've rebuilt the transaction table from memory. Now let's say that uh, for whatever reason, when the database crashed, these, write, these two writes didn't make it to disk, but that one did. So the database state at this point is all sorts of crazy. But we want to be able to reconstruct the state of the database correctly based on what's in the log and based on what's in the transaction. So the next thing we're going to do is go back in the log and figure out the first, uh, the first entry where we saw any transaction that was currently active at the time that the database crashed. So in this case, we're going to start from the very beginning of the log. Uh, and we're going to basically just go through the entire log and replay it from scratch. Rep uh, replay that one right. Replay that one right. Replay that right. And uh, replay that commit. Well, the commit. So we don't need to replay. So, so far, we've gone through two phases. The first phase, we've reconstructed the transaction table. And in the second phase, we reconstructed the correct state of the database. Now, there's a third phase, which is to observe that uh, transaction two was running at the time of the crash. And that means that we need to abort it. Uh, so, what we're going to do is go through the standard of work process. The last thing it wrote was uh, operation 3. So we're going to go and look at operation 3 and undo it. The first thing we're going to do for that is to record um, a compensation log record. Because we're about to abort it. 
And we're also, as part of this compensation log record, we're going to record the value or the operation that uh, we're using to undo. We don't actually need to uh, record what the original value is because we're already trying to undo it. Uh, and we're also going to record a pointer to uh, essentially the step in the linked list before this one. show you where that comes in in just a moment. But we're going to record this compensation log record and we're going to undo that right. At the same time we're going to update our transaction table essentially to hide uh, this transaction now never happened so the linked list is one element shorter. I'm going to repeat the process, undo that Transaction 2 is no longer actually written anything, so it's now safe to abort completely. We've got a CLR for SC. Now that all of the on disk manipulations have uh, finished, we can basically remove transaction 2 from the transaction table and record that fact uh, in our log. Okay, why go through all of this craziness? So what happens if... When can the system crash? Anytime. You should live in perpetual fear of dinosaurs coming in and eating your servers, or at least eating your server's power sources. And if not dinosaurs, then at least backhoes. Um, plenty of cases where a server cluster gets taken down, uh, a data warehouse gets taken down just because uh, someone tries to build some construction next door and plows through your power lines or your network cables or uh, something like that. And basically, the server could crash at any time. And uh, as database practitioners, we want to make sure that the data, once we tell the user that the data is safe, it's safe, we want to make sure that the database never gets corrupted. So the point of all of this, uh, this, these handstands is to make sure that a crash could occur at any point during this process and we can still safely recover, uh, from, uh, recover from a crash. So let me give you a little bit of a, a visualization uh, of, of the process that we went through. Um, crash recovery basically goes through three phases, uh, which are called analysis, redo, and undo. And the point of going through this, this, these handstands is to make sure that the analysis phase, the redo phase, the undo phase, no matter what happens, uh, the system could crash at any point uh, during any of those, those processes, and you'd still be able uh, to uh, recover from the recovery process. <laughs> so if a system ca uh, crashes during the analysis phase, uh, the phase where we're building, rebuilding the transaction table, absolutely nothing happens because the transaction table is entirely in memory. We're not doing anything to the disk. If a crash occurs during the redo phase, well, we're basically just replaying item potent log operations. We're not changing the state of the database. We're just bringing the state of the database back to the point it was when the crash occurred. If that happened, if a crash occurs uh, during that, it's no worse then the it's not going to be any worse than the original crash. Uh, the last thing that could occur is if a crash occurs during the undo phase, and here it gets a little bit dicey, uh, the reason that we're recording these compensation log records is that we can go back through the log, and if we see a compensation log record in the log, uh, then that basically signals to us that we can 
we've essentially told ourselves, yeah, we've already applied that change to the log, and reapply that that uh, that change to the log. But you can go back to your transaction table and uh, so uh, compensation log record basically serves two purposes. During the redo phase, this serves as a normal write that gets applied to the database. And during the analysis phase, it serves to essentially tell us that we don't need to, uh, we can ignore uh, another uh, uh, some operations that uh, occurred in earlier in the log because they've already been undone. This compensation log record basically counteracts the effects of, of this write. So during the undo, if a crash occurs during the undo phase, by recording the undo process uh, in, in, through these compensation log records, we're again not breaking anything because uh, we're recording everything that we're about to do, or that we are about to do. So during the redo phase of the next recovery step, um, the, uh, the the recovery uh, of the next recovery step, um, the those changes get applied just as well. Uh, okay, so one last optimization that I'll leave you with is this notion of checkpointing. So the log gets bigger and bigger as we go along. As we keep adding new, uh, performing new transactions, new writes, the log grows to potentially be very, very big. And the drawback to a very, very big log is that the recovery process is going to take forever. So in order to make sure that the, uh, the size of the log is bounded, uh, what we can do is periodically essentially record the transaction table on disk. Just take the entire transaction table, compute a snapshot of it, and write that transaction table snapshot to disk. Um, this is known as checkpointing the, the transaction table, and it basically allows us to start, uh, to start earlier in the log. What do I mean by start earlier in the log? Well, the analysis phase only needs to reconstruct the transaction table. So the analysis phase can start from wherever the last checkpoint was. The redo phase needs to go back further Um, it needs to go back further, but it only needs to go back to the first log sequence number uh, that you encounter in the transaction table. So if there was a checkpoint, let's say checkpoint here, transactions one and two were both active, but because of the fact that you only have two active transactions, you only need to replay, excuse me, replay the log from the point where the first uh, active transaction at the time of the crash um, started. And then the undo log basically needs to go back uh, again through the entire, uh, the entire transaction. Okay. Um, that was pretty crazy. Any final questions? All right, uh, Thursday we'll do a uh, recap for the midterm and see you then.